Tonight's presentation is on the water in the Galapagos and the Amazon. In 2017, Tony and Margaret Wright went on an adventure tour to the Galapagos and the Amazon. Um, they usually try and avoid uh, cruise ships. Somehow they don't like these cruise ships with maybe 3,000 or 5,000 passengers all with them. Uh, but then again, they can't do the opposite and uh, sail their own boat or charter a boat in these locations. So um, Tony's going to talk about being on a boat. It's sort of like the Goldilocks, not too big, not too small, uh, but uh, the one in between, uh, which gives you sort of an expedition feeling. Uh, the one in the Galapagos had just eight cabins. Uh, the one in the Amazon, uh, smaller still, had just three. Uh, Tony and Margaret are longtime members of the NSC. Uh, they started on dinghies uh, many years ago, and as with many sailors, their boat has now grown, and it grows uh, has grown up now to a 34-foot uh, Catalina called Vagabond. So I'm going to turn things over now to you, Tony, and let you go ahead. Thanks very much, Mark. Um, yes, yeah, so welcome. Uh, thank you for all showing up. Uh, I know some of you are probably be watching the. Uh, uh, Senators and Leafs game tonight, uh, so I'm going to distract you from that a little bit. Um, the, uh, the the adventure that we are going to tell you about, and I've actually recorded this presentation, so I'll step back in a minute and let you enjoy uh, some of the scenery that we got to see. Um, as Park says, we generally prefer to be on a boat where uh, we can captain the boat ourselves. Uh, but in the Galapagos and on the Amazon, that just isn't possible. So we tried to uh, find the next best thing to that kind of experience. And, uh, and I hope you enjoy this. So, uh, Sean, if you'd like to let it roll, uh, we'll be happy to answer any questions at the end. We always wanted to get to the Galapagos Islands one day. So in 2017, we decided to make it happen. While we were in the area, we checked out what else we could do and we picked going to Machu Picchu and a trip to the Amazon. Uh, since the theme of these talks is sailing and water-based adventures, I won't talk about Machu Picchu except to say that we flew into Peru to start out a journey, and then into Quito, Ecuador, to spend a few days before joining the Galapagos uh, cruise. To get to the Galapagos, you need to fly into Ecuador because it belongs to uh, that country, and flights to the Galapagos Generally, you're going to leave from Guayaquil, uh, which you can see there uh, on the southern part of the west coast. But most international flights will take you into Quito, and it is worthwhile going there because it's an interesting place to explore. Quito is the capital city. It's nearly 10,000 feet above sea level in the foothills of the Andes, and its center is just 16 kilometers south of the equator. Population is just over 2 million. There are lots of buildings there from its Spanish colonial past, which dates back to the 1500s. There are some spectacular churches that are very well maintained. The centre is a 45-minute drive from the airport, which is quite modern, and uh, we found that a very good one, although we had an interesting experience when we left. Uh, I'll tell you a bit more about that but it's certainly uh, one of the nicest airports that I've been to in South America. There are lots of festivals, parades, and occasional protests, and roads are often closed without warning. So bear this in mind if you want to catch a flight. Uh, we, uh, uh, and I'll just sort of share with you some of the noise of one of this, of this procession that we came across. We never experienced any problems during our stay, but we were warned to stay away from some areas. Mm -hmm. um, apparently it is dangerous to walk up through the steep hills of the neighborhood leading to this iconic statue of the Virgin Mary, which overlooks the city. And apparently it's actually higher than the statue of Christ the Redeemer in Rio. Uh, it's made entirely of uh, aluminum or aluminum, as we say in North America. And, uh, but it makes it uh, an interesting thing to visit. We, however, decided to play it safe and only went up with uh, the tour bus. 
I mentioned that uh, Ecuador is uh, close to the equator and uh, certainly there are a couple of sites you can take a tour to uh, which celebrate uh, its proximity or in fact its location um, uh, close to the equator. So this um, sign, this pillar, uh, supposedly marks the line of the equator, although when we were there apparently somebody disputed that it was accurately put there, but it seemed to be a bit of land that was useful for the purpose. It was close enough though that we didn't really care. You can see uh, a snow-capped volcano there, uh, and that is uh, apparently the only snow-capped mountain or mountainous structure that is actually uh, on the equator. Bottom right, you can see a number of greenhouses, and uh, these are for roses. The Dutch discovered that there are ideal uh, growing conditions uh, for roses, and it also helped that in the 90s, uh, the US enacted some laws which promoted flower growing in uh, South American countries. And Ecuador seems to have particularly benefited from this. Uh, they benefit from both the light and the altitude, which means that the stems grow straight, but also slowly, which makes them strong, and they can grow to over five feet tall. So we took the opportunity while we were in Quito for a few days to uh, take a little tour of, um, of a greenhouse or two. The best roses are sorted for export. Uh, Russia is one of the major importers. Apparently Russians like long, uh, thick stems full of thorns, whereas North Americans and Europeans prefer more smooth stemmed and shorter stems. After being sorted, they're stored and shipped in refrigerators. There's a refrigerator right beside this greenhouse. Refrigerated trucks come and pick the roses up and transport them to the airport, where they're then uh, packed into uh, refrigerated units. Now, they're not stored at the same kind of temperature as uh, COVID vaccines, but it helps to put the roses into dormancy so that um, they arrive fresh and they only start to um, you know, warm up once they get into the hands of the uh, uh, the people who have bought them in the different countries they're exported to. As we drove along, we could see uh, trucks transporting roses. Apparently these are being transported to local markets where they're sold at a far lower cost uh, than the export quality uh, roses. Uh, it's very interesting to see those and uh, pity we couldn't sort of buy bunches of them and bring them home, but that really wasn't practical. Um, damage um, damage better. Better. So the details for our flight uh, from Quito to the Galapagos uh, kept changing. Uh, originally, we were booked to go through Guayaquil Airport, uh, but it was due to close for runway repairs. So apparently those uh, repairs were going to start early in the morning. So we were going to have to get up in the middle of the night and uh, in order to fly into Guayaquil in time for the, the plane to uh, to continue to uh, transport us as well as other passengers that were meeting us in uh, Guayaquil. In the end though they decided that uh, that really wasn't practical and we flew direct into uh, uh, Baltra Airport in the uh, Galapagos. That change of plan though uh, did cause a problem for people who were joining the flight in Guayaquil. Uh, they were unable to um, uh, get to us, uh, get to our ship the same day. Uh, they had to make uh, elaborate arrangements to fly in on another plane the next day and then uh, get on some kind of speedboat to uh, catch up to us. The first impression you get when you arrive in the Galapagos is the importance of the environment and conservation. And there were many reminders of this uh, during our trip around the islands. We, uh, we noted that uh, this walkway uh, seemed to be covered in solar panels uh, and there were a lot of other uh, alternate ways of generating renewable energy to uh, power the airport and so on. So they're very proud that they were uh, a net zero airport, which uh, they claim to have been the first in the world to do this. When you transfer from the airport, you get to see uh, it's a very short bus ride and uh, the various um, 
ways of exploring the islands, the ships that uh, are available for you to, uh, to join and have a cabin on uh, are waiting uh, in the little harbor there. Uh, this one uh, that we'll see uh, just leaving is uh, the SS Mary Ann, and that offers a Galapagos cruise, um, which well, takes about a week normally, and uh, it has 22 cabins on board and a crew of nine. And they, we saw a number of other smaller sailing vessels as well. We saw, for example, the SS Nemo, which was a catamaran, um, and obviously you need to book well in advance if you get want to get on one of those. So this was the uh, tender that was going to be taking us to uh, our boat, a little less uh, elegant than the sailing ship we just saw, uh, but it uh, was actually a very practical uh, zodiac, or a panga as they like to uh, call them there. The uh, cage around the propeller, you'll see that in the water, that was uh, a very good safety feature that I, uh, I liked um, because uh, it's very easy to sort of slip off the boarding ladder and get your feet underneath that uh, zodiac when you're, when you're boarding. Um, and uh, you needed that because um, actually we did quite a lot of snorkeling, which is more than I expected. Uh, the ship was equipped with two of these Zodiacs, um, which was very uh, practical. Now this is the ship that we were actually on. It's the Celebrity Exploration. Um, it's 98 foot long, 320 tons, had just eight cabins and a crew of 10 plus a naturalist and guide. Um, and only six of those cabins were actually occupied on our trip, so it made for a very uh, uh, interesting small group exploration. Uh, being a catamaran, it was able to get in close, uh, so transfers ashore were uh, fairly quick. When they didn't have to sort of anchor out uh, uh, some distance off, which the larger ships would have to do. Uh, there aren't very many ships uh, that are available for uh, cruising around. Uh, the Galapagos, well, I say not very many, but I think there's a total of about 85 different sizes of uh, ships and sailing vessels that can take you around. Uh, I'm not aware of any opportunity for anyone to do private um, sailing around and exploration. You must have a naturalist or guide with you if you go ashore. Um, and the uh, number of people ashore are strictly limited. So uh, trips ashore have to be planned uh, well in advance. And of course, a company like um, Celebrity is uh, going to publish their itinerary well in advance, and so they make sure they have the permits to go ashore at the right time. They have to coordinate with the other companies. So this is an example of what they call a wet landing, uh, very familiar to anyone dinging, uh, dinging ashore in uh, Ottawa, on the Ottawa River, or in the BVIs. Occasionally we go into a dock, but more often we'd land on a beach like this. And uh, this was uh, very quickly after we arrived on the boat. It was a very short uh, trip from Balter across to a nearby uh, island uh, where we got to uh, meet up with some of the wildlife uh, very quickly. Sea lions and fur seals are the two um, uh, most common uh, creatures that you'll probably encounter on the beaches. Uh, they are very used to, uh, uh, well, I guess they're not used to having humans hunt them or anything like that, so therefore they uh, were not really bothered by us going in there. They're curious, uh, but it was never an issue. If they are occupying uh, a place you need to walk, though, uh, you need to uh, find a way to get around them. A little tricky because the authorities make sure that um, you only stay to the marked paths when you're uh, in the Galapagos. Beaches are okay, of course. Here's another guy that wanted everybody to know uh, that he was there, and uh, uh, quite a lot of fun to see these guys. There are all kinds of lizards that you'll come across, and the frigate bird is uh, never too far away, it seems. They're always uh, flying overhead near the boat, uh, or you'll see them off the beaches, uh, whatever. And we also got to see them on one of the islands um, nesting when we got a little bit later. Not all of the uh, animals you find on the uh, islands are alive. Uh, they leave the skeletons undisturbed. 
uh, by humans um, following a hands-off approach to managing wildlife on the islands. They try to leave them as natural mm. as possible. We'll take a few minutes just to uh, uh, cover the Galapagos timeline. Uh, the official discovery uh, of the islands happened in the 1500s. There has been some speculation that maybe some indigenous groups from uh, the mainland may have discovered the island uh, earlier than that, but there's been no conclusive evidence so far. We do know that uh, the islands were used in the, around the 1600s by pirates to uh, uh, reprovision. Uh, they would um, come in and, uh, and capture some tortoises and so on, which uh, stayed uh, nice and fresh on board uh, as food for a, for a long time. Uh, there's very little fresh water there though, so um, it wasn't uh, that popular a site for provisioning. Uh, it was used as a way station by whalers where they could um, sort of go ashore and recuperate a bit before going back out to uh, sea again. And there are some signs of, um, of some graffiti that they left behind and some of their equipment. Uh, the Ecuador actually claimed the islands officially in 1832. Uh, which was just shortly before HMS Beagle and Charles Darwin arrived, which is where most of us know the Galapagos from. Uh, it wasn't really um, settled much uh, around uh, uh, before the 1800s. Uh, 1929, the first group of European settlers arrived, um, uh, but they've limited the uh, number of people who can actually settle on the islands. And uh, many of them are actually uh, Ecuadorian or indigenous groups from Ecuador. Uh, in 1959, it became a national park, and it is now also um, a World Heritage Site from UNESCO. The name Galapagos, by the way, comes from an early 16th century Spanish name for tortoise or turtle. So... The next day, we set off for Southern Bay uh, on Santiago Island and, uh, and anchored there. This is a very uh, volcanic island with uh, evidence of recent uh, volcanic activity and uh, very interesting patterns that the lava leaves behind. Here are a couple of hornitos, the very small things that build up around vents from the, uh, the volcano. Uh, there's not much vegetation on this island, but uh, the cactus is one of the things that seems to grow anywhere, probably because it doesn't need much water. This guy is actually called a lava heron, and there's uh, a Galapagos lava heron. So he's uh, found uh, in amongst the lava, builds um, uh, nests around there, and uh, interesting guy. wasn't too worried about us, as is common with many of the other birds and animals. They live on uh, small crabs and fish. We climbed up the side of an old volcano, and as we look down, you can see evidence of other uh, calderas that have maybe collapsed a bit and uh, subsided back into the sea. Um, very interesting to see that. Here's, here's a few more landscapes with uh, just lava rock uh, everywhere and uh, volcanic craters. Here you can see how the authorities are trying to protect the natural state of the island by uh, only allowing the visitors to walk uh, in sensitive areas on boardwalks, uh, setting up viewing platforms and so on. From this vantage point, we can look down and see uh, some of the, uh, the boats that have come in that are transporting people to uh, the area for uh, doing the viewing. Our next destination actually took us across the equator to the north and then back to the south. Um, so we crossed the equator twice as we navigated around the north island of Isabella to, uh, into Irvina Bay. And of course, a uh, frigate bird offered a flyby along the way. 
Now here's the um, schedule for us uh, for the um, Monday, the Monday of the day we arrived in uh, Isabella Island. I hadn't realized how often we would have the chance to snorkel. It was, of course, mentioned in the brochure saying there'd be opportunities to snorkel, but I probably should have given this a bit more attention uh, when we were preparing for the trip because I didn't bring an underwater camera with me, but quickly wished that I had. Uh, I found the uh, snorkeling there to be quite amazing. Uh, it was just as interesting to see the underwater life as it was to see the, uh, the life on the islands. Uh, one couple who was on our, in our group actually had a GoPro, which was an ideal camera, and uh, uh, that's something I wish I'd had with me. There was nowhere to buy one by, by the time we got there, um, but uh, so too bad. Now, on the other hand, the ship provided um, everything we needed to go snorkeling, other than the cameras, and they provided wetsuits and snorkel gear. Uh, they were individually fitted and labeled so that we knew which one was ours uh, each time it came to putting on uh, the equipment to go snorkeling. Uh, it was really good that they did that because the water was surprisingly cold in the deep water locations. It's due to the cold water current, which comes all the way up the west coast of South America and uh, into the Galapagos. Uh, that helps to both, um, I think it's called the Humboldt Current, and that uh, helps to um, provide for a big variety in the kind of uh, sea life that you see there. Um, but it was also very nice that they provided warm towels when we came back out of that uh, cold water uh, to dry off with. Meanwhile, uh, back on land, this is uh, after we'd landed on Isabella Island, we're walking along a path and we came across this guy, a uh, large iguana, he wasn't too bothered by us and wasn't in a hurry to go anywhere. The tortoise took one look at us though and decided that uh, maybe you know, it'd be better off heading back into the bush, but it was our first view of a Galapagos tortoise and that was quite exciting. But this guy really wanted to uh, uh, show us uh, that he was in charge of this place, so we had to give him uh, some space and so on. Uh, this is a Galapagos hawk. Uh, I'm not sure how long ago he killed this particular piece of his prey, though. I think uh, that might have been there for quite a while. Now, I'm not too sure exactly what the story is behind all of this different uh, graffiti. Some of it looks more recent than others. Uh, what caught my eye was uh, the name Vagabond. Uh, looks like that was a Swedish boat that had come in at some point. Uh, so maybe for this kind of reason, I, they don't seem to be too keen on having cruising boats uh, visit anymore. But uh, for historical purposes, they seem to have left these uh, untouched. Now, uh, the schedule mentioned that we uh, were going to have an opportunity to either go snorkeling or kayaking. Now, if you went snorkeling, you would see uh, shoals of fish. Uh, I'm used to when you go snorkeling and uh, when you dropped anchor somewhere in a, the warm waters of the BBIs or something like that, you might see one or two of these guys at a time, uh, a few of them. Uh, but really, I found in the Galapagos, we were swimming, swimming around with schools of these kinds of fish, very colorful, all different types. Just off the beach, the very first fish I saw was a parrotfish. Yeah, it was all uh, quite, quite exciting, as I say. Wish I'd had a GoPro or something like that. We chose to go snorkeling in this particular instance because it was a very interesting uh, thing to go and see. We could see Galapagos penguins diving off of the, uh, the cliffs, uh, but we also came across, and this is not my photo, but uh, the only way to really show you what this guy is, this is a mola mola or an ocean sunfish, and they're absolutely huge. Uh, we could see the fin, but we were told we didn't need to worry about that. It wasn't a shark, it was uh, a mola mola. Uh, and uh, you could see then the, uh, the surface of it and what a gigantic slow swimming monster it was. It was just absolutely fantastic. So here we are uh, on another island, just uh, the group sort of heading up in between uh, the lava rocks. And some people kayaking and our uh, ship there uh, at anchor waiting for us uh, to come back. Here we are the next day 
anchored off of uh, Nandina Island and uh, going ashore there we got to see a whole different group of animals and this is what's uh, interesting about these islands they all have uh, a very different kind of characteristic different groups of animals are prominent and so on and I had seen these guys coming up on on a David Attenborough special about uh, the marine iguanas of the Galapagos and what's interesting about these is they've learned how to feed off of kelp underwater so they swim around and and eat underwater vegetation rather than land-based uh, vegetation they are the only iguanas in the world that do this and uh, they ingest quite a lot of salt which they have uh, developed a capability to expel by spitting it out and you can see them lazing around getting heated up by the sun and then occasionally uh, spitting things out they do tend to live in quite uh, crowded conditions and uh, we only saw one or two fights there There's the, there's the kind of motion that you'll see when they're, uh, they're spitting out the salt. Didn't really get to capture, capture that too much. Now these are the Sally Lightfoot uh, crabs and I was excited, excited to see the first one and made sure I got a good photo but pretty soon I realized you could see them everywhere and uh, uh, it gets quite tiring to keep taking photos of uh, Sally Lightfoot crabs but I uh, wanted to make sure I got a good one. Now I really can't tell you whether this is a sea lion or a fur, a fur seal, but I'm going to say sea lion. Um, but uh, certainly they, they, they seem to like to pose for photographs. Now this is a blue-footed booby and a Galapagos brown penguin. There are several thousand uh, pelicans on the islands, uh, lots of boobies. Um, and they are the ones that uh, I was particularly keen to see and so here was the first one of those that we saw. Uh, these caught my attention as well but these are actually American oyster catches that are probably migrating. When we left Fernandino Island the captain invited us in to, uh, uh, to witness the crossing of the equator and uh, here it is on the GPS at uh, latitude zero to uh, every decimal point. We next headed back to the main island, um, round at the southernmost point, um, where we went ashore to go to the Darwin Research Station, where they are breeding tor tortoises. And I didn't realize how much tortoises love be spending around in water, and how much time they like to be in mud baths as well. You might need to be careful if you turn your back on the tortoise. At the harbour there was uh, a fish market uh, with some beautiful looking fish. Uh, the uh, spotted red fish that you see there are sea bass, spotted sea bass. Now here you can see how the local wildlife gets in on the action when uh, seafood is being prepared for sale. Uh, these are lobsters that our chef decided to uh, to buy so to prepare a special supper for us that night. Now in our uh, last full day in the Galapagos, we got to wander uh, in a mangrove and got close to all kinds of different uh, birds. As you can see, this one is a red-footed booby. These are a pair of Nazca boobies, uh, absolutely beautiful plumage, which they spend a lot of time grooming, and they seem to pair off because they need each other's help to keep that all looking so nice. Always amazing to see 
Now, what appear to be fairly heavy birds can uh, perch on some pretty flimsy branches. They were all wobbling around a little bit there. This is a juvenile frigate bird. On a small stingray uh, swimming around in the shallow waters of the mangrove. So we did, we were uh, a little bit careful where we walked, and uh, but it was interesting uh, to see them. And this is a swallow-tailed gull hiding in the mangroves. It always uh, seemed to us that we were leaving a bit too soon. I uh, could have spent a lot more time there exploring, uh, but it was a, a great trip. I'm really glad uh, that we went. As we were uh, waiting for our bus to take us back to the airport, uh, not everybody got uh, a chance to sit down because we found some of the seats were occupied. So next, we decided we were on our way to explore the Amazon. Ecuador, Peru, and Colombia all have rivers that feed into the Amazon, which empties into the ocean, of course, in Brazil. The only way to get there is to fly into Coca from Quito. Quito. So there are few flights. It's important not to miss the plane. So we stayed overnight at the airport. We noted that we were booked into row one uh, on the airplane. We were looking forward to some special seating, but we found we were facing backwards and looking at all the rest of the passengers on a full flight. That was some experience. So due to the altitude, height of the Andes Mountains, uh, the plane flew down a pass through the mountains. Uh, that seemed a little uh, unusual, but uh, I guess you get used to anything when you travel enough. On arrival, we were driven to a briefing on what to expect, and they showed us this, uh, this map of where we were going. As you can see, the river we're actually on is the Napo River, which then becomes the Amazon uh, a bit further down. And what we're, where we're going to is into uh, national parks and natural reserves. Uh, so the Yasuni National Park was uh, uh, really a fantastic uh, place to be going. The brochure mentioned that we would be uh, uh, transferred on a motorized canoe, uh, but it was a little bit more than that, as you'll see uh, in a minute. This was quite a large canoe uh, powered by two large outboards. Navigating the river on it is quite tricky. Uh, the current's strong, the sandbanks are consistently shifting, constantly shifting. There's lots of debris from eroding banks, etc. You get heavy downpours and that uh, causes the water level to go up and down quite a lot. Again, uh, making it uh, hard to know exactly where a safe passage is. But the uh, driver is really skilled at doing that when it gets particularly tricky. He gets one of the crew uh, to uh, go into the bow of the boat and uh, and keep a lookout and uh, using hand signals to you know to uh, indicate which way he should uh, he should drive. There is no hydrographic chart of the river, according to the owner, uh, who was with us on this particular cruise, uh, and it's very interesting. You'll see that the uh, the boat that we were going to be actually traveling on the river on in, in a minute. Now it is good that they had two outboards on this uh, fast canoe. Uh, because on the way back, uh, we were um, you know, going upstream and we were having to catch a flight uh, by a certain time. You remember I mentioned that there are not too many flights. You have to make sure you, you don't miss it. Um, but uh, one of the outboards hit a branch and cracked the transmission case. So we had to continue with one motor at half speed. Uh, and uh, that made for uh, an interesting uh tension on the uh, trip on the way back. You'll also see there are panels which will drop down uh, and that's necessary to protect you from the torrential downpours that happen. We were warned that if you sit up the front you might get a little wet and uh, so I paid some attention to that. Somebody else didn't and got rather wet. So just to show you what it's like uh, actually traveling uh, on that canoe it made for it was very interesting scenery. There's a shuttle boat which actually belongs to one of the oil companies transporting workers back. And this is the river boat that we traveled on. It's got a steel hull, shallow hull boat. And um, this boat was actually built in Guayaquil. 
uh, specifically custom designed, built by the, uh, the owner of this company. There isn't another one like it. Uh, and he told me that uh, in order to get it to this river, it was uh, cut up and then re-welded together once it arrived uh, at the Napa River. Soon after arrival, we were equipped with uh, rubber boots and uh, off into the jungle for a night walk. You can see there's a, uh, it's not a, it's a bit of a blurry picture, but you might see a telescope there. And what we were watching for was some parrots who were coming into nest at the top of a tree. And here they are. Uh, and uh, pity we don't have a little video there, but there's a lot of squabbling going on about who got to perch on the top. Uh, and this is apparently where they come in to, uh, to nest at night. Looking down at the, uh, gara at the um, jungle floor now, here you can see leafcutter ants uh, walking in a column. This is a type of pit viper. It uses its tail to attract its prey. Uh, best not to get too one, close to one of those, they are quite uh, venomous. But we also came across a very small but deadly snake. Um, if it was bigger, we would have been really worried, but this is a fer de lance, which apparently is the most poisonous snake in the world. And we're told by the guide that um, the good news is, uh, because it was small, it wouldn't have a lot of venom. Uh, but the bad news was, because it was small, it wouldn't know how to regulate how much venom it used, so it would just deliver all of it in one bite, which would be bad news. Here are a few other creatures, which uh, uh, this one's camouflaged to uh, resemble a leaf. A couple of frogs. And a moth. Rather large spider. I don't know what it is about um, uh, tarantulas, but guides always like to introduce you to those guys. This is a rainbow boa. Uh, probably not as big as it looks in this photograph. This will give you a little bit of context as to uh, the size of it. Now, of course, this is not venomous, so uh, I wasn't too worried about this one. So here we are, um, traveling uh, down a branch of the river and looking for wildlife. This branch, apparently dead, seems to have some interesting fruit hanging for it, from it. When you look a little closer, you can see they're actually uh, a bunch of small bats. Now, of course, we also did a little bit of um, uh, canoeing, a little bit of kayaking, um, and uh, this was on the Piranha Lake. Uh, I wasn't sure if they were joking, but uh, we actually were then, shortly afterwards, they got us fishing for piranhas. So uh, uh, what they gave us was a length of line with a piece of stake on the end of it, and uh, we were just sort of jigging for uh, piranhas. Uh, I wasn't lucky, uh, but here's one of our guides, caught himself a very nice piranha, as did uh, one of the passengers. And uh, you might just see as she's kissing this piranha, uh, I don't know whether this is uh, an Ecuadorian custom, but uh, you might see the piece of steak that the piranhas uh, not quite managed to eat. The, uh, you need binoculars, cameras, and so on. Now, one of the uh, things that's a little bit of a problem when you're uh, in this area is the humidity and heat, and uh, you need to watch out for your lenses and keep your uh, camera lenses dry. I thought I might have damaged mine, but uh, turns out it was just condensation on the, uh, on the lens, a little bit of uh, greasy condensation. So once I cleaned that off, uh, it wasn't so bad. <clears throat> Looking up in the trees, you can see uh, all kinds of uh, monkeys and sloths. The uh, weather was often a little dramatic. 
Uh, it didn't take long for uh, the, the weather to move in and for heavy showers. Here's part of the uh, sandbanks at a low spot of the river that I was mentioning. But this is a good place to see wildlife, and these are rosate uh, spoonbills. And here's our uh, motorized canoe stopped for uh, a little excursion ashore. Uh, this is more like a bit of traditional watercraft. When you get into the more shallow areas and going through the swamplands and the uh, mangroves, we switch to um, regular canoes with paddles. But this was quite a large one. We didn't have to do the paddling ourselves, but it was quite tippy, so we had to make sure everybody didn't move around too much. And here we are going through the uh, through the forest a bit. And this is the kind of guy we were looking for, a caiman. Now this was uh, a bit of a challenge for me. Um, anyone that knows me at all well will know that I uh, do not like heights at all, particularly heights connected with uh, man-made structures. Um, I've got no problem flying, but uh, once we get uh, into this kind of rather flimsy looking structure, uh, it's not something I enjoy at all. And um, we had to climb all the way up here in order to enjoy the view from a viewing platform that was built into the top of this tree. Uh, and as you can see, the platform itself doesn't look all that robust, but uh, we persevered. And uh, what was particularly interesting was one, uh, one other of our uh, group uh, was also somebody who didn't like the heights. But we had a mysterious crew member who had uh, accompanied us on this particular excursion, and he was carrying something. Turns out that uh, he was carrying champagne. And uh, the guy here in the red shirt had uh, decided to abandon the attempt to get all the way to the top. He, was, uh, he got as far as about two flights of stairs from the top, and he was just shaking so much he couldn't go on. But then he heard the, the pop of the champagne cork, and that spur, he said, OK, I'm not missing out on that. And he came all the way up, and uh, we enjoyed champagne for uh, having made the climb. So... Uh, Beautiful evening sunsets on the river, as you often get. And I'll just leave you uh, in the Amazon with uh, one more of these. What I will just mention is uh, the outside, I said, we had interesting experiences at Quito Airport. And uh, while we were waiting for our flight uh, to uh, begin our journey back to Canada, uh, I was called over to the uh, checking count, uh, desk or the... Uh, the desk uh, while we were waiting in the departure lounge and they uh, told me that they needed to open my luggage and I was escorted downstairs where they took my passport, made me sign a form, opened my bags and uh, they were searching through it. And uh, one of the things we'd taken with us uh, were some special rolls of toilet paper from uh, Mountain Equipment Co-op for uh, journeys into uh, countries where they don't always supply toilet paper in the uh, in the facilities so we have this uh, travel these travel packs with us and um, this is what they had spotted in the x-ray and they deemed it suspicious so I don't know whether they thought it was rolled up cash or uh, drugs of some kind but uh, once they realized that's all it was then I was uh, free to go and the uh, the drug enforcement dog looked at me with some baleful eyes saying okay next time buddy I'm going to catch you so I hope you've enjoyed that and ready to take any questions now. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, just before we get to uh, questions and your answers, um, I'd like to turn for a minute and uh, put our uh, uh, attendees to work. Uh, we have a poll to do uh, with three or four questions and uh, uh, I'll have uh, Stephen put them up now, and uh, you can uh, uh, have a look at them and uh, maybe spend 30 seconds on that. While you're answering those questions, uh, 
I have to uh, apologize for a mistake I made. Next week, um, Ron Shute is not going to speak. He's going to speak later on, on the uh, 10th of March. Uh, next week, we have uh, John Ray going to talk. And uh, I guess for all of us that have older boats, uh, sooner or later, water intrudes into the rudders. And unfortunately, sometimes they break, sometimes they fall off. Uh, John Ray is the guy you want to talk to. He's going to talk about foils and rudders, and uh, basically, it's what his company uh, does. So uh, that's next week's presentation, uh, talking a little bit about uh, foils and rudders and uh, maintenance and so on. So, any case, uh, you have the questions there. And I think we've just displayed some of the answers. Says I'm not allowed to vote. So, in any case. So how are we doing on responses? In a moment, we'll see those. We have, uh, uh, we've uh, concluded the two polls. So uh, um, thanks everybody for participating. Very good. I see those now. So um, Tony, we have a bunch of questions and uh, while I'm putting some of those together, I was wondering, I guess I got the chance to answer or ask my first question all by myself without anybody else. Um, I saw that evening uh, in the Amazon looking out over the waters and I remember what it's like even here in the Ottawa River looking out in the evening as I'm eaten by mosquitoes. Yep. Um, tell me, did you have to take special precautions because of malaria and mosquitoes in that area? Yeah, well, before we um, uh took the trip, we did go to uh, the travel clinic and, uh, and um, take the appropriate medications and we were on anti-malarial medication as well. Um, so, uh, but then we also, uh, they recommended a, a kind of a, a bug spray as well that we used. And by doing that, we actually found that we weren't really bothered there by mosquitoes, half as bad as we are on the Ottawa River. So. Uh, it, it seems to be odd. I think I think the Ottawa River uh, and those kinds of areas in Canada tend to be worse than they are in the tropics. Interesting. Um, I noticed that you took the chance of uh, canoeing uh, with a few other people in Piranha Lake, but it looked to me like you had about three inches of freeboard. If anybody sneezed, you and the piranhas may become very close friends. Was it quite as bad as it looked? Well, um, didn't feel that bad. It was, uh, I mean, they were kayaks. So uh, we just made, made sure we kept our balance and didn't, didn't trust ourselves too much. I see. Okay. Um, and I saw you kissing. Well, I guess it was not you. It was somebody no, else kiss, kissing the, the piranha. Yeah. Yeah, there was no screech involved. So... Uh, well, I was going to ask you about that. Is it like uh, in Newfie, where you uh, are become a, an honorary Newfie by kissing the cod? I think that was just a crazy Austrian doing that. I'm not sure there was anything else to it. It's a good way to lose a nose, perhaps. I don't think so. Yeah. Any case, I should start with the real questions here. They're uh, coming in, and I'm just looking at them. Um, there's a question here about rain. And you talked about putting these screens down on both sides of those motorized uh, canoes. Yeah. Uh, how much rain was there while you were there? And I, I assume it was like torrential rain, but yeah, there would be there'd be short, sharp downpours. So uh, uh, and we were equipped. They um, they equipped as well. You saw that uh, probably in some of the photos that we were wearing rubber boots. That's pretty important when you go uh, walking in the uh, the Amazon. Lots of sort of swampy areas you're going to walk through, um, and the uh, they gave us capes, 
and then they would put the screens down on the boats to uh, protect us. Um, but then, you know, that that downpour would last for, I don't know, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 15 or 20, and then it would clear up again. I see. And is it like people talk, tell me about monsoons where it, where they say the rain is a bit like standing under Niagara Falls? Is it quite that bad? Uh, I would say at times you could that would be quite apt. You know, it was not not quite Niagara Falls, but certainly it was a heavy downpour, like you, like you get in a heavy thunderstorm here. I see. Okay. Um, how many nights was the uh, Galapagos portion of your trip? We were we were actually in the Galapagos for uh, seven nights. I think we, we arrived on a Saturday and left on the Saturday. And they do recommend uh, that uh, if you go to the Galapagos, that you spend at least uh, five days there. It's a, it's a very big area. Uh, so uh, getting around the Galapagos, um, they tend to travel uh, at night um, if, you're, if you're going a longer distance. And uh, I was surprised that the water there was actually a bit choppier than I expected it. So uh, when they were traveling, it was generally advised that you on the, the so that, that ship wasn't that small, but it was small enough that they advised us not to be out on deck while they were underway that night. Sounds like you almost needed a lee cloth to stay in bed. <laughs> well, it's certainly, uh, you, 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 it, was, uh, it was a challenge sometimes, yeah. Um, I see that Stephen Kidd would like to answer one of the questions here as well about uh, bugs and mosquitoes. So uh, Stephen, if you're on air, can you uh, come forward? There you are. Oh, there's a, a, a just a general question about how bad the mosquitoes and bugs were on the Amazon. Yeah, no, they weren't. Uh, I, I can't say that I remember being particularly bothered by them. Um, you just need to be careful. You don't want to step in, uh, you know, a, um, a column of particular kinds of ants. Uh, that's the kind of stuff you've got to watch out for, but uh, the, the mosquitoes and bugs themselves weren't bad. Maybe it's because we were, we were taking precautions. We were covered, we had bug spray, and uh, they, they tended not to, not to bother us. Stephen, would you like to go ahead with the next question too? Yeah, sorry. Um... Overall, was the trip, um, the duration sufficient, or would you recommend longer? So um, if we talk about the trip itself, I think, I mean, we were away for nearly a month. I, as I mentioned at the, the outside, I didn't cover the, the, the part where we went to Machu Picchu and then came back and spent a bit of time in Lima and then in Quito. Uh, so we were gone for about a month, and I think that, that was a good time. I think, uh, you know, the Galapagos is something that you could certainly spend, uh, you know, longer time in. We didn't get to see the whole Galapagos, but I think we saw a very good representative part of it. And as you saw from that sort of daily itinerary, they, uh, they made sure we got value for money. Even the day we were leaving to catch a plane, we still went out in the early morning for an exploration. So uh, it's good, good when you get a company that really sort of fills the itinerary for you. There's a question here that uh, uh, came up, up, but I think it's already been answered about uh, how could you kiss a piranha? Uh, but I think you've well answered that already. And there's no screech well, involved. Well, I, th I think the answer to that is very carefully. <laughs> <laughs> Probably true. So, I guess there's a question here about um, could you show up in a more independent fashion or are the tours to the Galapagos all um, strictly regulated? Uh, it reminds me a little bit of in-tourist in the 1970s when I traveled through Russia, where yeah. my in-tourist agent said at the doorway of the train, please come with me. Yeah. Well, I think the um, uh, I think you can go there more independently. They they have hotels certainly on the main island, um, like uh, I think Baltra Airport. I forget the name of the island that one's on, but uh, if you know around by where we were at the fish market, there there's uh, several hotels, uh, and you can certainly stay there. 
and then you can take um, uh, day tours, uh, but you're not going to get very far on a day tour. Uh, remember, um, I think the you know some of the overnight itineraries you're um, you're traveling at ten knots for uh, a good 10, 12 hours to get to your next destination. And, uh, and if you want to see that, then it's uh, sort of hard to do that too independently. So you're better off on a on a boat so you can keep uh, keep moving. And did you fly back then to the mainland to uh, Quito or well, you went to a place called? Uh, yeah, so, we, so we, yeah, we, we flew back into Quito, stayed at the airport um, because then we had to rendezvous with the next tour uh, the following morning at Quito Airport. So they picked us up at Quito Airport and flew us into Coca. Okay. And, and then we came back into Quito. Interesting. When we, when we, when we came home, um, there was at the time no direct flight from Quito back to, uh, back to Canada. So we actually had to fly through Panama City. And okay. we saw quite, quite a contrast between the uh, brand new airport of uh, Quito and how clean and hygienic everything was. People, we were very impressed with how, um, you know, the food preparation being done in the various um, concessions at the airport. You could see people wearing gloves and uh, everything was very uh, clean and almost antiseptic in the way that they were preparing things. And then you arrive in Panama City and uh, quite the opposite is true. It was a chaotic, disorganized airport and uh, I, we really didn't want to buy anything that wasn't already sealed in a package. Or, uh, you know, we bought a banana because at least we could peel the skin on that ourselves. Panama Airport or Panama itself though is quite interesting. It, when I first arrived, I assumed it was going to be something like uh, most of the Caribbean islands and instead it looks like you're flying into Chicago with all the high-rise condos and hotels and so on. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, I didn't, we, we just flew into uh, Panama City in order to make a connecting flight, uh, but they seem to be a bit concerned about security there. It was, it was the first time I've arrived at an airport which you actually go through metal detectors as you arrive at the airport uh, before they let you into the international sort of um, I mean, we, were, we weren't entering the country, basically, we were just entering the airport to connect to our next flight. And Air Canada couldn't tell us which gate they were going to be leaving from. There was no information about the Air Canada flight we were supposed to be connecting to. <laughs> so we had to keep, we, we kept on asking different people in the airport, any idea where the Air Canada flight leaves from? Because nothing was on the departure boards. Uh, nobody had any information. So some people said that while well, Air Canada normally leaves from flight uh, from gate 81, so we went and hang we went to hang around gate 81, and eventually an Air Canada person came by and said, "Oh, you're looking for the Air Canada flight?" We said, "Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, we're at a different gate today." So, well, nice of you to tell us. You know. <laughs> oh well. Um, there's a question too, I guess, about how long it took to do all the planning ahead of time before you went on this uh, trip, because it's not something you can go down to a travel agent or arrange that way. No, we have actually, we did, um, uh, we did go to uh, like an independent travel agent that we'd used before uh, for making, um, when we did a, a trip to Asia. Uh, and we'd done a, quite a bit of research on online and then went to them with some ideas as to uh, how we'd like to go and ran it by them and then they modified it a bit for us. Uh, we had some friends uh, who had done the Amazon part before so we found out uh, um, how they had done the Amazon thing and then we managed to sort of cobble it all together. And so yeah it was probably uh, took a, a few weeks to plan and then it's best to sort of plan it a few months ahead of time because it's uh, it's hard to get into some some places you know. Galapagos can get pretty booked up and we were going to Machu Picchu as well and that's another thing you have to book a few months in advance you can't do it at the last minute. No and uh, you were there in 2017 I think uh, that yeah. was one of the questions I think that's what it was. Yeah the question was what time of the year did we go and we went um, at the uh, the after, after haul out is when we went so uh, we went to uh, the end of October we started the trip and we were in the uh, Galapagos. I think uh, we arrived on the uh, 25th of November. 
Oh, okay. So you got back just before Christmas or just? Uh, just yeah, just before Christmas, yeah. Okay. Um, Stephen, would you like to go ahead and answer the, or ask the next question about, uh, about the water? Sure, sure. So Tony, um, it was interesting learning, the question reads, that the water was so cool when you were there at the Galapagos, even though it was on the equator, is the water cool year round? Yes, it is, because um, this is one of the interesting things we discovered is uh, it's related to this Humboldt current, which basically brings the water up from the Southern Pacific uh, that's come around sort of the, the, um, the, the, the bottom of uh, South America and it comes all the way up the West Coast and it's a deep current. And then when it arrives in the Galapagos, it's still bringing nutrients with us and so with it uh, and so on, but it stays fairly constantly cool. Uh, so it, it only warms up along the beaches. So when you go in the water off a beach or something, then it feels fairly warm and, uh, and you don't really need much of a wetsuit off the beach. But as soon as you go into uh, areas where the water's deeper or maybe the water's welling up a bit of a, an underwater cliff face, uh, which is what, what you feel you're swimming alongside sometimes. There's like a vertical drop um, and uh, you're, you're swimming in this sort of aquarium kind of setting on a, and all these different fish, uh, you know, swimming around the, the cliff face underwater. Pretty amazing. Then you get the penguins diving off the cliffs above and, and uh, shooting past you. And you wouldn't think you'd find penguins at the equator, but in the Galapagos you do. Fascinating. Sounds a bit like uh, the Ottawa River again. Your feet are freezing. Yep. But maybe up on the top, you're not too badly off. Exactly. So uh, how did you choose what islands you were going to? Uh, was that just because of the tour group? And would you yeah. choose different islands? Uh, like the one of the islands I saw there was the volcanic island, yeah. which seemed to be devoid of any vegetation or anything else. It was sort of like a hunk of rock in the middle of the ocean. Yep, well, some of, some of them are. Um, basically, all of the Galapagos are volcanic islands. Uh, just some of them are older than others. Uh, but uh, there are still active volcanoes in the Galapagos. Uh, and so the, the islands are constantly changing. So there's new land arriving as the result of uh, volcanic activity. Some of it has been eroded because they're older volcanoes. Uh, so when you choose an itinerary, um, if you're looking at you know, the people that are gonna take you around, you want, if you've got a particular interest in seeing uh, particular kinds of uh, wildlife, we had some people on our trip, for example, who were avid bird watchers from Quebec. And, uh, and they were so excited to see all kinds of different birds. Um, and, uh, and others, uh, obviously the people that came with the GoPro, uh, they were, um, they really wanted to uh, see the underwater uh, life. And you did see so much. I mean, I was just amazed. Uh, you know, when I went swimming for the first time off the beach, I mentioned I saw a parrotfish. I don't think I've ever seen a parrotfish in the wild before, only in an aquarium or on uh, our own shows and to find one you just swim off a beach and you come across a parrotfish. I was pretty amazed. Wow. And, uh, and at one point I was swimming over a bunch of uh, reef sharks as well. So uh, that, that, was kind of, that was kind of interesting. One of the fish you did talk about uh, seeing while you were there and it was sort of a sluggish thing, but looked a bit like a, uh, a big balloon in the water, head and tail but uh, a big uh, animal. You never really said how big it was. And unfortunately we didn't have anything to, to gauge. Was it? Uh, True. Uh, it was probably, I, 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 I don't want to exaggerate, but I know these things can get pretty ma massive. Uh, it's probably the size, I don't know, of um, a small whale, something like that. Is this a fish story? Nope. <laughs> No, it was pretty massive. Uh, it, was, it was certainly several times the size of our kayak. Oh, so it's bigger than you. Oh, much bigger. Yeah. Um, I think you said it was, um, what was it, a sea? They call it a, they call it a mola mola or an ocean sunfish. Ocean sunfish, yes. 
I always think of a sunfish as being very small, like yeah, yeah. how much? Yeah, well, then yeah. We, we see the ocean is very big, so I don't know. I see. So uh, this is rather formidable. I would not be happy, I don't think, to be swimming beside it. No, well, I was kayaking beside it, so that was all right. Oh, I see. Okay. Uh, okay, any more questions there, uh, Stephen? Uh, no, I think we've covered them. Yeah, so I got um, somebody was saying that, uh, oh, you say, can you show up with your own boats? And that's why that's why I say I don't think that, as um, uh, far as I could tell, it has to be kind of prearranged. I mean, I, I would I, I wouldn't say definitively no, but it's just that based on everything I learned, which is how tightly they regulate, you know, the um, the going ashore. Uh, that it has to be pre-arranged and pre-booked. Uh, for example, um, we needed the services of a doctor at one point, and uh, we had to rendezvous with the National Geographic boat. Well, our, our ship knew where the National Geographic boat was going to be the next day, and uh, so we were able to make a rendezvous with them because they, they were going to be at that bay for a certain period of time. But you know, if other ships are arriving, then they have to coordinate it with other ships leaving. So you cannot have more than a certain number of people at one island at one time. I see. There's a question here, and I guess it's one that I'm going to answer, um, and it relates to the fact that we're doing all this in a virtual world right now. Um, so somebody reminds us of other years when we've uh, taken up collections uh, during uh, the time we haven't had these talks at the sailing club and the collections being uh, distributed for youth programming or oriented towards youth programming. So the question was about a virtual beer jug that can uh, be used to uh, make a real contribution to the youth programming in NSC. And uh, so far we have not got that far uh, in our planning. Uh, perhaps it's something we should start considering, but uh, no, we haven't really uh, thought about that at this point. And so thank you for uh, the wishes that uh, I think are expressed there, but uh, no, sorry, we haven't done that yet. Maybe you can keep that in mind when we get all back together again uh, later this year, if we're really lucky, but much more likely next winter, and uh, remember the uh, the real uh, beer jug that we pass around at that point uh, to make uh, the uh, collection. So I guess the last question there is about uh, the last couple of questions uh, about uh, Gallipagos. Can you make bookings from Quito itself, or is it too late by that time uh, to make a booking from Quito? Um. I can imagine that it would be possible, particularly, I, I, I mean, there are some of the operators are local operators uh, of smaller boats. Um, I, I think it might be a little harder to sort of book, say, a National Geographic boat or a Celebrity Cruises boat. But if you were going to be booking with uh, an operator who's based in and sails out of the Galapagos, I'm sure they must have some um, connection to Quito. Probably Gaia Quill, though, would be a more suitable base to book from if you're going to be booking locally. It's on the ocean, isn't it? Yeah, Gaia Quill is sort of the main port of uh, Ecuador and the, the southwest there. Right. And they're, uh, and that, that they have the closest ties to uh, Galapagos. There's uh, another, sorry, Tony, there's a question here about the animals on the Galapagos, uh, that the animals there are somewhat besieged, uh, seeing all the, even the uh, limited number of visitors that come. Well, that's why they uh, they regulate the number of people um, very closely, uh, and the did guides do their best to keep people in check to make sure they do stay on the path. Uh, I think the, the the guides can get uh, quite heavily fined if they don't, um, uh, you know, regulate the visitors uh, properly, and they have constant inspection going on. So they're they're quite concerned about making sure that they do not disturb the animals in any way whatsoever. You can see they leave everything as natural as they can. That's why you see all those uh, skeletons of uh, dead animals 
lying in place. They just say they're just going to leave everything exactly the way it is, the way it was naturally. And they try and make sure that they route the paths. They've got these stakes that the, um, the guides use to follow. And the animals know that we stay on those paths. And uh, as long as we're on those paths, we're not disturbing the animals. And because they've never seen people as a threat, uh, it doesn't bother them. And so, you know, I didn't get the impression that the animals were uh, at all bothered by our presence or besieged or any way you want to look at that. So I, th I think we're, I think they're okay. But obviously, you know, if you get misbehaving visitors, uh, that wouldn't go well. Sounds a bit like our experiences with our bylaw officers with respect to distancing and COVID uh, concerns and so on. Uh, so uh, perhaps you uh, did something three years earlier than the rest of us uh, getting ready for the new world that we've uh, experienced this past uh, few months. Yeah, well, it, I, I totally, you know, everybody needs to go and see something like that. It's just an amazing experience. It's, it's, uh, it's a long way to go and it's not cheap, but it's, uh, uh, you know, you feel as if you get your value for money. Thank you very much, Tony. Uh, really appreciate that talk. Uh, there's a number of uh, comments here uh, thanking you for your time and effort and uh, for uh, showing the appreciation that uh, people have had for uh, spending the time here uh, speaking to us. One last thing before we close, uh, John Ray is going to be uh, talking here next week about uh, foils and rudders. And so look forward to seeing everybody here again next week. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, interest and uh, look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.